from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the National Book Festival. We're in for really something special today. I'm, I'm glad you all could be here. By any standard, Susan Richard Shreve has had a remarkable career as a writer, teacher, and woman of letters. She is the author of 15 novels and 28 books for young people. And often in these books, what she is chronicling is the way we deal with change, and particularly how children deal with change, how our moral codes are shaped, and how in moments of crisis we respond, how to hold true to our values and responsibility. Susan once wrote in an essay, fiction is a glimpse at our common humanity, a reminder of it, a generous engagement between the reader and the imagined world of a book. So much of what we do as writers, no matter how grounded in the particular a story might be, is a leap of faith. Readers have been making that leap of faith with her for decades now. Whether she's taking us through 100 years of social history or putting us on a train to Milan in which a terrorist bomb explodes, she's constantly exploring new territory, new situations, new characters, while staying close to her interests and family. What passes between parent and child examining the gifts and burdens of legacy. In her new novel, You Are the Love of My Life, the backdrop will immediately be familiar to Washington readers, the Senate hearings on Watergate. And not surprisingly, secrets and issues of truth abound. Among the many awards Susan has received, or the, she's been a recipient of the Guggenheim, the National Endowment of the Arts Fiction Award, and the Edgar Allan Poe Award and she has taught and nurtured young writers at George Mason University for 30 years. And we're very fortunate to have her with us today. Please welcome Susan Richards Shreve. Thank you, David, and it's great to have a writer introducing a writer. This book started because I was interested in the years I was just beginning to raise children, and I hadn't a clue what was going on, because you don't have a clue what's going on when you have little children, and I have four of them. And I wondered what was going on in 1973 besides Watergate. I was also incredibly curious in this era of transparency when we know so much more about one another with Facebooks and Facebook and email and simply the times we live in. Um, they call it transparency and it's quite transparent. What was really going on in 1973? And I was from a small town in the Middle West, grew up in Washington and came back with little children to raise my children. Didn't happen to be 1973 when it came back, but it was later. But I grew up in a time in which you kept secrets. You didn't tell anything that might embarrass your children, embarrass your family. Now this was, I think, conventionally Midwestern. It was certainly true in our family. And much later, after my parents died, I found all of these surprises. And they were surprises that were not bad surprises, not dreadful surprises, but I certainly wished I'd known them at the time. So this book really came out of a sense of what was going on in 1973 and what was happening when I was raising children. It's about a young woman who, at the age of 12, discovers her father's suicide in an area of Washington that is pretty much like Chevy Chase, D.C., though I grew up in Cleveland Park. And the city is full of neighborhoods, as you know, and they're kind of intact, and they have their own culture. In any case, her father is a special agent to President Truman, and he is, has one child and is married, and he commits suicide after he has been found in Union Station, not Union Station, in the Y, um, in, in the act, in a homosexual act. And he knows it's going to be in the papers the following day. So he goes to a rental house, 
an investment property that he owns to clean it up for the new tenants. And he kills himself, hangs himself in the basement. And this 12-year-old girl who is dispatched by her mother to go into the house to look for her father finds him. They quickly leave Washington. The mother is humiliated and embarrassed and says, we're going to make ourselves up. We're going to invent ourselves as other than who we are. And don't ever say anything about your father or what he did or who he is or was. Um, he's dead. That's all you need to say. So she's grown up as an only child with a single mother in Santa Fe um, telling lies. That's what she has done. She is now, as the book begins, uh, and the part I'm going to read, she is now a children's book illustrator and writer. Uh, she's a successful writer. She has two children, and the father of her two children is Uncle Reuben, and Uncle Reuben is married to somebody else. And she's come to the realization that he is never going to leave his wife and marry her. The house in Washington where her father committed suicide becomes available. It's been a rental property, and it's the only thing she owns. And so she decides to go to Washington and um, live in this house, which is full of dark memories, and remake her life full of light. So this is the first chapter. And it takes place in February 1973, shortly after the Paris Peace Accords, when the American people were beginning to recognize the, um, the cost of our being in Vietnam, the cost and also the lies that we had learned from the, gov that the government had given us. And Watergate was in play at this time. Um, so, chapter one. The afternoon in February when Lucy Painter was moving from New York City to the house in Washington where her father had died, threatened violent storms. Lucy stood on the sidewalk outside the apartment on Sullivan Street, looking between the buildings at a slate gray agitated sky, a raw damp to the air. Snow, she said to no one in particular. Snowman. Felix said. He was standing on the sidewalk next to his mother, holding the large yellow chicken Reuben had given him as a going away present. If it's snowing in Washington, we'll make a snowman when we get there, Lucy said, lifting him into the truck she had leased for the journey. Reuben was sitting on the back of the U-Haul, eating a turkey sandwich while Mickey, the boy he had hired to help with the move, carried the small items down the steps of the four-story walk-up. Bite, Reuben asked, patting a seat beside him on the back of the truck. Lucy pulled the orange wool cap he had given her for Christmas low on her brow. I'm not hungry, she said. But he pit pinched off an edge of the sandwich anyway, careful to get plenty of turkey in the bite, and popped it in her mouth. I'll call us as soon as I get to the office in the morning, he said, and every night before I leave from work. Not Reuben's first promise, nor the only mention of his plan for keeping in touch after 13 years of living within blocks of each other, together several times a week whenever he could make it work. And that's that, Lucy asked. Of course that's not that, Lucy, he said. We have a permanent arrangement. She climbed up on the back of the truck beside him. Somehow, the permanent part always slips my mind, she said. He dropped his hand on top of hers, pressing his body closer, and she knew that what he wanted her from her now was silence and her company sitting next to him, the heat of their breaths warming the winter air. Can we talk before I leave, she asked. We always talk, Lucy, he said, his eyes half closed. We've said everything we have to say to each other. What Lucy wanted was an argument, a chance to fling collected grievances at one another, to set them at serious odds. Whatever conflagration that might erupt to alter the sensible path she had chosen, which was to leave New York. 
But Reuben Frank wasn't going to budge. He would be even tempered and sweet, quietly determined to avoid a scene until the moment she hopped in the driver's seat and with the children headed south towards Washington, D.C. Your choice to move, remember, Reuben said, wasn't exactly a choice, she said. She watched as the boy Mickey brought the work table she'd had since college down the steps, concentrating on the details of what she needed to do in the hours ahead. The boxes and suitcases and odds and ends she was tossing in the trash, toys for Felix in the car, books for Maggie, her list of things to do she wouldn't be moved, so she wouldn't be moved to weep every time she caught a glimpse of Reuben's shock of red hair falling across his forehead. Here comes Mabby, Maggie, Ruby, Reuben was saying, as Maggie rounded the corner, her arm around Rebecca Malone, a tendency he had under pressure to register the obvious. Rebecca wants to know why we have to move to Washington, Maggie said, coming up to the truck. Because of money, Lucy said, as she had said to Ag Maggie many times. In Washington, I own the house, and it's less expensive to live there than in New York. She reached over, brushing her mittened hands across the girl's cheeks, easy with children, half a child herself, as Reuben would say. That's not exactly true about why you're moving, Reuben said, the words falling into his scarf so the girls wouldn't hear him. What would you have me say, Lucy asked, the truth? I'm just a little surprised that you're so upset, angry, he said. Maggie was leaning over the large bin of refuse in front of the apartment. I suppose you threw out my whole childhood, she said. She pulled a raggedy Ann from the trash, shook her, picked dust motes out of the red yarn hair. You told me raggedy Ann could be tossed because she's covered in cat throw up, Lucy said. I said she was covered in cat throw up, not that she could be tossed. Maggie dropped the soil doll back in the bin and leaned against Reuben's legs. So you'll come see us? You know I will, Reuben said. A lot? We'll see, he said. I'll come as often as I possibly can. And maybe we can go to the beach this summer? Maybe we can go to the beach, Reuben replied, which Lucy noted was a lie. How could he possibly get away from his real life long enough to take Maggie to the beach? And what would he plan to tell Elaine? What does a lot mean, Lucy asked after the girls had headed down the street. I don't know what it means, Reuben said, agitated the way he got when pressures bore down on him, as they had when he first met Lucy, and again and again in the years they'd been together, more or less together, depending on the point of view. This is a trial, Lucy, and of course I want to see you as much as possible. Just don't say we'll see. She could feel his furtive glance, sense the familiar fear mounting in him as he scouted an escape route, the way he always seemed to do when she wanted more from him than he was capable of giving. That was the nature of their lives together, his terms. Lucy pulled her cap down lower on her eyes so the wool brushed her lashes. I won't say we'll see, Reuben said, and I won't lie to you. Oh, Reuben, Lucy said, you have only lied to me. She didn't mean that, didn't mean to make a scene on the day of her departure, not in front of Felix, who was sitting beside her while the truck was loaded, not in front of Reuben especially, who had counted on her free spirit and independence, her willingness to live sufficient unto herself, which was all that had ever been possible between them. But she couldn't help it. She wanted Reuben to ache for her the way she did for him. He had opened the New York Times to the front page, retreating to the newspaper to avoid a discussion of his personal life with Lucy. Have you been reading about Watergate, he asked, crossing his legs, leaning against the side of the truck. She shook her head. Every day on the front page, did you see that Gordon Liddy and James McCord were caught up in this shindig? I don't read the newspapers when there's bad news, and there's always bad news, she said. She seldom read the papers at all, and never the national papers. 
The news of her father's death had been reported in the national section on the front page of the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Evening Star. All over the country, according to her mother. Sometimes she read the features, personal stories in the metro section, and occasionally the arts, but never the real news that had marked for Lucy the end of one childhood and the beginning of another. Well, all of them are lying to us, certainly Nixon, Reuben said. Lying again has happened with Vietnam. And how much else don't we know about the truth? There's a regular culture of lies infesting our lives. Felix had scrambled off the truck, dropping the yellow chicken in Lucy's lap, trotting over to play in the square of garden next to Lucy's building with his friend Ernie. If I spend any time thinking about lies, it has to do with you and me, Lucy said, wrapping her arms around her legs, resting her chin on her knees. Reuben folded the paper and put it down, uttering a sigh of defeat. Have you thought again about telling the children what happened, he asked. With you? Lucy slipped off the back of the truck. With you, he said. I won't tell the children anything, if that's what you're asking. Not asking, he said, wondering. He leaned over his lips against her temple. You know, Lucy, you're really kind of an original. There was a weariness in his voice or irritation or sadness. Otherwise, you don't join the movement and wear that red and black women on top t-shirt and leave me for good. Maybe I will, she said. Not the t-shirt, but maybe I will leave you for good. Mickey was loading up the U-Haul with boxes and lamps wrapped in blankets. The couch Lucy had taken from the curb after graduation, left there by students at Brown or friends of hers at the Rhode Island School of Design. Our furniture is junk, Mama, Maggie had said the day before as they were packing up, Reuben dropping by with tacos for dinner. Maybe we should leave it here, but it's our junk. It's secondhand. Other people I know have first-hand furniture. Even Rebecca has first-hand furniture, and her mother is poor as a church mount. Your mother's an artist, Maggie Rubin said. She doesn't worry about furniture. She writes children's books. That's not exactly an artist. I'm her editor, he said, grabbing Maggie's hand, twirling her into his arms and out again. Lucy Painter is an artist and your perfect mother. Everyone in the neighborhood knew who Lucy Painter was when she walked through the streets of the West Village, shopping for dinner or books or off to the playground with Felix or PS 117 with Maggie. She was small and girlish with a mop of fat black curls in short flowered skirts she made herself, like the one on the back of her book jackets, striped tights, a long scarf wrapped around her neck, hanging to her knees. Especially the children loved her. That's Lucy Painter, they call out to their friends or their mothers. And Maggie, walking with Lucy, would whisper, how embarrassing. But she loved her famous mother, loved the way she looked with her bright cheeks and big boots, her tiny hands, like the hands of a child. Lucy met Reuben Frank when she was 19. She had gone to New York City at her art professor's recommendation to show, show her portfolio of strange supernatural animals painted in the brilliant colors of the desert to publishers of children's books. She was sitting on a bench in the lobby of 555 Fifth Avenue where George Barnes Books, Inc. was located, gathering the courage to take the elevator to the seventh floor. When Reuben, carrying a bag with his lunch, the New York Times under his arm, rushed through the revolving doors into the lobby and saw her. Her shoes were what struck him first, her feet curled under a short orange flowered skirt, her shoes red ballet slippers with satin ribbons resting toe to toe under the bench. Hello, he said, can I help you? I'm looking for Mr. Reuben Frank of George Barnes Books, she said. I have an appointment with him. You do, Reuben asked. More or less, she said. She had found the name Reuben Frank in a book listing New York editors and publishers, but had not called in advance to arrange an appointment, had not even thought to call. 
She simply expected that Mr. Frank would be happy to look at her work because her professor at RISD had told her she was an artist of unusual talent. At least I hope I'll be able to meet with him when I get upstairs, she said. I brought my pictures. Luckily, you've run into the right person, he said, watching as she wriggled her feet into the ballet slippers. I can arrange that meeting instantly. In the elevator, Lucy leaned down to tie the satin ribbons around her ankles, her hair parting to expose a curve in the shape of a half moon at the nape of her neck. That did it, he told her later. Just the sight of your small neck had moved him. On the seventh floor, the elevator doors opened, and he led the way down the corridor, past the cubicles of editors, past the design room, the front desk with a young girl on the telephone, and into his office with its large window overlooking Fifth Avenue. So, he said, clearing off his desk, I'm ready to see your work. There were six paintings, only six, she realized, when she thought that they all fit on the top of the desk, looking more strange than she remembered, the color maybe too bright, the animals unnaturally thin and pointy. So what do you think, she asked quickly. I don't think about illustrations, he replied, raising the Venetian blinds behind his desk, picking up one of Lucy's drawings. He held it at an angle in light that spread across the room from the south-facing window. You don't think they're too queer to put in a book for children, do you? She asked, sensing Reuben's hesitation. He was leaning over his desk, examining a hedgehog-like creature with brilliant yellow eyes. I think I love them, Reuben said, reassembling the por portfolio, setting it on the edge of his desk. I can't tell you why exactly. I simply know what I love and what I don't. Lucy put her feet up flat against the side of his desk, flushed, her heart pounding. So now what will happen, she asked. Now I'm going to be your editor, he said. You are? And that's that? More or less. You'll go back to school and imagine a story for these creatures of yours, and then we'll do a book together. Not together, she said quickly. I do everything alone, always, completely alone. We'll try it, Reuben said. If it doesn't work between us, it doesn't work. He was falling in love with Lucy, with the wild imaginative figures she had brought to him, with the possibility of flight. He was 35 and married and childless. This is very lucky, isn't it, Lucy said, as they walked back down the corridor to the elevator. Certainly lucky for me, he said, these wonderful original illustrations. He reached over, running his finger lightly down the bridge of her nose. Goodbye, my new surprise, he said as the elevator doors open. Hello, my new editor, Lucy said, stepping through the doors, her head down, looking at her red ballet slippers as the doors closed. For hours in the next month, she would lie on her back in the tiny single room of her group house at RISD, imagining Reuben his hand on her belly, his breath in her hair. There was no stopping the rush of feeling, no instinctive fear or hesitation in loving Reuben. He would leave his wife. They would marry, as he said would happen in their long conversations from his office, as he hoped would happen. Not a good fit with Elaine, he told her. It was as if the whole of her life since her father's death had led to this particular man, Gentle like her father had been, certain of himself, her editor, who could be counted on for everything. Mickey climbed in the back of the truck with two lamps from the living room, a poster announcing the publication of one of her books, and under his arm a stuffed Dalmatian, missing its tail. Done, Mickey said, the apartment's empty. Reuben slid off the back of the truck. So you can get on the road early, he said. There are still boxes in storage in the basement, Lucy said. Reuben pulled up the collar of his jacket. The wind had picked up books and things I haven't looked at since they were packed up in the house where I was born, Lucy said. I don't think I've ever been in the storage room, he said. I'll go get them. 
I'm coming too, Lucy said, leading the way down the narrow winding stairs, flipping on a light in the storage area where wire cages lined the walls in a room smelling of mold and the dank reminder of residential rats. These are books, Lucy said, unlocking the combination to her storage room. And the boxes marked Lucy, 1951, are from the house on Capitol Hill where I used to live. That morning, before Reuben had arrived with the U-Haul truck, Lucy thought of opening the box with her father's things to show Reuben the story from the Washington Post about his death. The story itself with the news she had already told him. He was the only person she had ever told the truth about her life. The books were packed in boxes of 10, author's copies from George Barn Books, Fervored pea drain pipe lost in the Chinese Museum of Art was stamped on the side of one of the boxes, and there were several boxes of belly over the banana field, and two of loop de loop and the spider monkey from Dordogne. Reuben lifted one of the old boxes, clouds of dust rising in the air, collecting just above his head. Have you ever even opened these, Lucy, he asked, clearing his throat of dust. The cardboard is actually disintegrating. Once I opened one box and taped it back up, she said. I didn't want to look at my childhood then. You're going to have to repack them when you get to Washington. He struggled up the staircase, leaving Lucy to carry the smaller boxes, which had followed her since they were packed, traveling from Washington, D.C. to Santa Fe, to Providence, Rhode Island, to New York City, and now back to Washington. I hope you won't be too lonely, Lucy said. Sometimes you keep too much to yourself. I'll be fine, she said, but Ruba knew her too well. She longed for company, for friends drinking tea in her kitchen, sitting in the window talking as dusk came on, while the children played just within hearing. She wanted to be close in the way that she felt to the strange little characters she wrote about in her books, to lie in bed after the children had gone to sleep alone as she often was, and shuffle through the playing cards of people she could call in the morning to ask them to come when Maggie had the flu. A best friend, someone she could tell about her mother and father, about Reuben. But there was always with Lucy a conditioned reserve. The closest she had come to the friendship she imagined beyond the casual gathering of telephone lists from Maggie's school for bake sales and class trips and potluck suppers, was walking through the West Village with her children, smiling at the people who knew her from her books. In Washington and without Reuben, she would change that. Darkness was coming on early, not the ordinary slow curtain fall of a winter day's end, but quickly a storm-chased afternoon. They finished packing up the U-Haul and locked the back door. It was almost four in the afternoon and already dark. The storm threatening, but no report of snow on the weather station. Lucy lifted Felix into the cab and Maggie climbed up behind him. Do you want to check the apartment to see that everything's okay for the next tenant, Reuben asked. I suppose I should, she said. We'll be right back, guys, Reuben said, asking Mickey to stay with the children until they returned. The apartment was empty. Lucy's breath caught in her throat. She wanted to leave quickly to hurry down the stairs and out the door and into the weather to tell Reuben goodbye without lingering over what remained between them. I'll check around, he said, leaving her in the living room, opening the closet doors, the kitchen cabinets, the tiny cupboard in the front hall where Lucy did, had kept the children's toys. He was standing at the toy cabinet when she turned around and headed towards the door. Not yet, he said. He put his hand on the small of her back and pulled her towards him. Your smell isn't here any longer, is it, he said. It smells of cigarette smoke. You're the one who smokes, she said. He took her hand, a veil of dust between them, his hands dry. Don't say anything, she said, not a word. I was just going to say it's dusty in here, he said. It was always dusty, he said. I never noticed, she said. He kissed her sweetly, softly, pressing her body against him. But she turned, 
pushed his arms away and headed down the steps and out the front door to the truck. Finally, it was beginning to snow. Don't forget to take the tunnel out of town, Reuben called, standing beside the truck as it pulled away from the curb. Lucy could hear him from the open window, but she didn't check the rear view mirror for one more look. The traffic was heavy in the city, and the trip was going to be long. Already, Felix had asked to stop to pee. Thank you. Just leave. Uh, yeah. Anybody have any questions about this domestic, little domestic tale? It was uh, the interesting part to me in, in, in writing it, just thinking of the ways in which times change and what we adjust to and what we are accommodating in our lives was really how very different 1973 was from today. A certain kind of optimism, a certain kind of, I think, abandon, different rules of, of behavior. It wasn't entirely, I mean, two kids with the same guy who's married to somebody else is a little unusual, but it wasn't entirely unusual in that time. And certainly, her children do not know who her father is. They love this man they call Uncle Reuben, but they have no idea that he is the man who was their father. So that it was just simply interesting to watch my children, who are now raising children in a very different time. And of course, what we're always trying to do is to dismiss the, the two or three major failures of our parents in raising us and do something that is just the opposite with our own children who will do the same to us once again. So I, I was very conscious that one of the things that is happening would not have happened when I was a little girl um, with my parents. And so that it was interesting and I see actually in my children raising children that it, it uh, is both a much more conventional time than ours was, which had all of the civil rights movements, the civil rights movements in terms of women and blacks and, and homosexuality because 1973 was the year the, the, of the decriminalization of homosexuality. So it was a kind of amazing year of changes that took place against a landscape of a lot of public lies. And in many ways, this is a story of a neighborhood uh, to which she moves as someone who has made up her life and is not going to tell the truth about it, um, living private lives. Anybody? Hello. Um, I wanted to know if, do you believe that the historical context of families, like which you explained between uh, a father and a mother and how they deal with their kids, is better or worse than today's present context? That's a very good question. And gosh, I don't know. I hope that my children learned good things from my failures and won't do the same thing. But I do think every time brings up new issues and new, th new things. And I, I think that um, essentially one of the problems we've always had in this country is how we, re we treat our children and how we raise them. And it couldn't be more evident than our education system for public schools. So I think a lot rests on parents today. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you guys very much. Thanks for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress.
visit us at loc.gov.